whether it's addiction to prescription opioids, illicit street drugs, or a dependence on alcohol. But there are many misconceptions about addiction, and to help clear those up for us today is Dr. Michael Beer, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and an addiction specialist. What is the biggest misunderstanding about addiction, Dr. Beer? Uh, the biggest misconception is that addiction is a failure of will or a moral failing or uh, something about which people have complete control over and should feel ashamed about and guilty about. say heroin addiction this is a really stupid question right it's obvious we all know it heroin causes heroin addiction here's how it works if you use heroin for 20 days by day 21 your body would physically crave the drug ferociously because there are chemical hooks in the drug that's what addiction means but there's a catch almost everything we think we know about addiction is wrong Almost everything we think we know about addiction is wrong, 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 wrong. An empty bottle tells you nothing at all. Tells you nothing at all. Tells you nothing at all. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Amy Leo. Today's show really came out of an inspiration to fill a need we here at Escaping the Rat Race are seeing in our community. So this episode is all about addiction with the main purpose to bring more understanding into the world by shining a light on some of the misconceptions surrounding this topic. With that being said, our primary focus on today's show is actually to offer support to the loved ones, the family, the friends, the significant others of people that are struggling with an addiction. So to do that today, we're going to offer up a few initial disclaimers and some thought-provoking truths. That's really to set you up to get the most out of this show and really open up into a deeper listening space so you can learn something new and take away something that can be really helpful to you when it comes to this topic. We're also going to share real-world testimony, both from the perspective of someone who struggled with an addiction and from that of the loved one. We're going to also highlight some innovative research that is being done, as well as highlighting some helpful concepts that you can explore if you are the loved one. So some helpful concepts and perhaps some action points that you can take home again with you at the end of today's show. And of course, at the very end, we're going to share some of the most beneficial resources that our team has come across when it comes to addiction, recovery, mending relationships, and moving forward essentially resources that have really supported people in finding true and lasting healing and true and lasting relief. So without further ado, my guest speaker today is Kelly Munstrud. Kelly, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Amy. And I'm glad to be here. One of the reasons I asked Kelly on is because we both have real world experience with addiction and that, you know, on either the side of a family member or someone that's actually just caught up in the throes of of addiction. I I mean, I I hesitate to use that word. I actually hate the word addicted. And and more specifically, I hate the word addict. Okay, I hate that word. That's just my personal opinion. But the way that I see it, I mean, it really downplays the innate capabilities that are available and built into every single human being. And, and what I hear, at least in our cultural tale, Kelly, and I I know you're going to speak about this yourself, what your experience has been, but it really sets up this weird us versus them mentality, right? It's kind of like this moral judgment better than you. And the fact is that's not true. Right. Exactly. Yes. So a human being can never really be an addict, okay? Because an addict doesn't define who someone is. 
this might be the first time that you've ever considered that notion, so I want to clarify what I mean. A person can engage in an addictive behavior, yes, but behavior is not the same as who someone is, who any of us are. Using a substance is a verb and no human being can ever be a verb. Someone is just a human being like me, like you, like Kelly. And it's a human being that's really just doing the best they can. And we all aren't usually very comfortable feeling uncomfortable, right? Those moments of insecurity, of boredom, of anger, of sadness. And and people that use drugs or alcohol are really innocently just trying to feel better. Granted, it can be a strategy that does incur a lot of real world problems, right? Like theft or violence or not, not to mention the physical and psychological danger um, and, and harm that's done to both the person struggling with obsessively, you know, thinking about a substance or using a substance in the family members. So all those things are real today, but, but we really want to offer again, a different kind of conversation that I think we've already kind of set up. I want to make it really clear as this can be a really heated conversation and I want folks to allow themselves to absorb something new or see something perhaps differently that may be more helpful to them moving forward. So I'm not saying it's not important to set boundaries with people in your life that are addicted to a substance or to sex or to gambling or whatever that is, okay? This isn't usually how the conversation around addiction goes. What I'm trying to highlight is this humility piece that gets missed a lot. And it's really helpful to recognize essentially that everybody poops, okay? So what I mean by that is I don't know many human beings who when they are experiencing an uncomfortable emotion in their body like anxiety, sadness, self-doubt, self-loathing even, it's a pretty universal experience that when someone's in pain like that, that they will try to get out of the emotional discomfort. So what I'm saying is that it's helpful to recognize that you do that too as a listener. Maybe when you're uncomfortable or you feel anxious, you go to the gym or you go to yoga or you feel depressed. So you start doing a thinking technique or a breathing technique. You're doing the same thing by trying to escape, quote unquote, the painful or uncomfortable feelings. You're just using different strategies. So of course the behavior is different, but I really wanted to dive into the psychology behind that first, because it begins to humanize other people. So there is a gentleman who's doing some really interesting research called Johan Hari, and we wanted to present a small clip of his work and we'll source his work in the show notes at the end, but let's take a quick listen. Journalist Johan Hari. This talk contains powerful visuals. Download the video at TED.com. Here's Johan Hari. One of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to. And I was just a little kid, so I didn't really understand why. But as I got older, I realized we had drug addiction in my family, including later cocaine addiction. I've been thinking about it a lot lately, partly because it's now exactly 100 years since drugs were first banned in the United States and Britain, and we then imposed that on the rest of the world. It's a century since we made this really fateful decision to take addicts and punish them and make them suffer because we believe that would deter them, it would give them an incentive to stop. And a few years ago, I was looking at some of the addicts in my life who I love and trying to figure out if there was some way to help them. And I realized there were loads of incredibly basic questions I just didn't know the answer to. Like, what really causes addiction? Uh, Why do we carry on with this approach that doesn't seem to be working? And is there a better way out there that we could try instead? So I read loads of stuff about it, and I couldn't really find the answers I was looking for. So I thought, okay, I'll go and sit with different people around the world who've lived this 
and studied this and talked to them and see if I can learn from them. And I ended up, I didn't realize I would end up going over 30,000 miles at the start, but I ended up going and meeting loads of different people from a transgender crack dealer in Brownsville, Brooklyn, to a scientist who spends a lot of time feeding hallucinogens to mongooses to see if they like them. Um, <laughs> it turns out they do, but only in very specific circumstances. To, to the only country that's ever decriminalized all drugs, from cannabis to crack, Portugal. And the thing I realized that really blew my mind is Almost everything we think we know about addiction is wrong. And if we start to absorb the new evidence about addiction, I think we're going to have to change a lot more than our drug policies. But let's start with what we think we know, what I thought I know, right? Let's think about this middle row here, right? Imagine all of you, for 20 days now, went off and used heroin three times a day. Some of you look a little bit more enthusiastic than others at this prospect. <laughs> um, the, don't worry, it's just a thought experiment. Imagine you did that, right? What, do we, what would happen? Now, we have a story about what would happen that we've been told for a century. We think because there are chemical hooks in heroin, as you took it for a while, your body would become dependent on those hooks, you'd start to physically need them, and at the end of those 20 days, you'd all be heroin addicts, right? That's what I thought. First thing that alerted me to the fact something not right with this story is when it was explained to me, if I step out of this TED Talk today and I get hit by a car and I break my hip, I'll be taken to hospital and I'll be given loads of diamorphine. Diamorphine is heroin. It's actually much better heroin than you're ever going to buy on the streets because the stuff you buy from a drug dealer is contaminated, actually very little of it is heroin, whereas the stuff you get from the doctor is medically pure. And you'll be given it for quite a long period of time. There are loads of people in this room who may not realize that you've taken quite a lot of heroin, right? Uh, and, for, and anyone watching this anywhere in the world, this is happening. And if what we believe about addiction is right, those people are exposed to all those chemical hooks. What should happen? They should become addicts. This has been studied really carefully. It doesn't happen. You will have noticed if your grandmother had a hip replacement, she didn't come out as a junkie. <laughs> and when I learned this, it just seemed so weird to me, so contrary to everything I'd been told, everything I thought I knew, I just thought it couldn't be right. Until I went and met a man called Bruce Alexander, who's a professor of psychology in Vancouver, who carried out an incredible experiment that I think really helps us to understand this issue. Professor Alexander explained to me, the idea of addiction we've all got in our heads, that story, comes partly from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. They're really simple experiments. You can do them tonight when you go home if you feel a little bit sadistic. You get a rat and you put it in a cage and you give it two water bottles. One is just water and the other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. If you do that, the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself quite quickly. So there you go, right? That's how we think it works. In the 70s, Professor Alexander comes along and he looks at this experiment and he noticed something. He said, ah, we're putting the rat in an empty cage. It's got nothing to do except use these drugs. Let's try something a bit different. So Professor Alexander built a cage that he called Rat Park, which is basically heaven for rats, right? They've got loads of cheese, they've got loads of colored balls, they've got loads of tunnels. Crucially, they've got loads of friends, they can have loads of sex, and they've got both the water bottles, the normal water and the drugged water. But here's the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, they don't like the drugged water. They almost never use it. None of them ever use it compulsively. None of them ever overdose. You go from almost 100% overdose when they're isolated to 0% overdose when they have happy and connected lives. Now, when I first saw this, Professor Alexander thought, you know, maybe this is just a thing about rats. They're quite different to us. You know, not, maybe not as different as we'd like, but, you know... Um, but fortunately, there was a human experiment into the exact same principle happening at the exact same time. It was called the Vietnam War. In Vietnam, 20% of all American troops were using loads of heroin. And uh, if you look at the news reports from the time, they were really worried because they thought, my God, we're going to have hundreds of thousands of junkies on the streets of the United States when the war ends. It made total sense. Now, those soldiers who were using loads of heroin were followed home. The archives of general psychiatry did a really detailed study. And what happened to them? It turns out they didn't go to rehab. They didn't go into withdrawal. 95% of them just stopped. Now, if you believe the story about chemical hooks, that makes absolutely no sense. But Professor Alexander began to think there might be a different story about addiction. He said, what if addiction isn't about your chemical hooks? What if addiction is about your cage? What if addiction is an adaptation to your environment? Looking at this, there was another professor called Peter Cohen in the Netherlands who said, maybe we shouldn't even call it addiction. Maybe we should call it bonding. Human beings have a natural and innate need to bond. 
And when we're happy and healthy, we'll bond and connect with each other. But if you can't do that because you're traumatized or isolated or beaten down by life, you will bond with something that will give you some sense of relief. So that clip was taken from Johan Hari's TED Talk entitled Everything You Think You Know About Addiction is Wrong. He also has a book out called Chasing the Scream. What I really admire about this piece is the fact that it started with the realization that he doesn't really know much about addiction. So he had the humility to question what he thought he knew, and he discovered many, many eye-opening realities and truths. With that, let's continue on with a testimony of what it was like to be someone addicted to a substance, and then we're going to get into what you can do as a loved one or not do. Kelly, what was helpful to you and what was not helpful to you when you were going through the throes of your own addiction? I suppose since I'm one that always likes to build up to the hope, I'll start with what was not helpful. It was um, constantly blaming just blaming everything. And once the blame has been satisfied and that belief of all my memories of the things were once I, I, you know, there's been so many different experiences I've had during addiction, but I think one of the most destructive ones was when I finally said, well, I, I'm the one after years, uh, not being addicted, but years of um, post-divorce even, um, I, I came to the conclusion that it must be me, so I'm worthless. Screw it. Where's my bottle? Go to the fridge. Instant happiness. And I didn't even have to have a drink. I was just like, yep, I got it all figured out. I'm worthless. So who cares? I'm just going to keep drinking. And before you know it, that just catches up to you. And it's it, the same thing would happen every day, more or less. Well, I'm worthless. Nobody cares. So here I go. Whee! Yeah. Until I found myself laying there in bed most of the day. Couldn't get in the shower hardly. I mean, I don't want to describe the whole physical process that it took me through, but I'm leading to what was helpful. You know, I finally realized somehow for a long time that this is destroying my body. Now a new set of fears sunk in. Now my thinking was I'm going to die. Oh yeah, that's right. I just got done telling myself for days, weeks, months, years that I didn't care about that. And by then I wanted out. Now I was Now it was an actual prescription that I felt I had to have because my body wasn't functioning. I, again, I won't describe it, but what was helpful is that I wanted out. And by wanting out, I mean, I wanted to stop drinking. I wanted to stop my addictive behavior. And it was then that I started to see and look toward my higher power that AA or other programs might reference. And I prayed. I'm not saying praying or anything is right. I'm just saying that I just, I had so much. I didn't have the strength or courage to go to ask anyone. I just hoped that it would. And, And the day that it did come, finally, here's the hope. Finally, when it did come, I was ready. So I was taken to the hospital once I gave, once one, once that certain friend, friend said, they loved me. Then I knew it was time to go. So in I went to the hospital and there's another long story there. But the, the most helpful part in the throes was the fact that I realized that I needed out. And when the time came, it, I was able to get out. It was my body that got out. It was my body that needed out. 
yes, I wanted out. Is that a prerequisite? It's certainly... <laughs> it's certainly something that makes the difference because if we don't want out if we keep enjoying that escape which I did for some time then the realization that you need to go the reason that you need to go becomes a defense mechanism I'm not going to listen to anybody I'm the only one who knows best for myself and I have decided that I shouldn't be. It's like I already decided that I would never be able to be loved. Keeping this in the relationships, in the love and relationships realm of our show, especially, but very true to my experience, was the fact that I figured that I was not worthy of being loved anymore because I've made my mistakes, I had my chance at life, and now I've messed it up. And that was my downfall, was to continue to think that until my body started failing me, as I mentioned. And when I started realizing just how bad it could be, for instance, having diabetes or whatever it was, I was seeing when I was looking down at my leg. The miracle that I'm speaking of, wanting to get out and having those friends come, was only the beginning. That's just the first step. The real miracle <laughs> is what we're sharing in this show in regards to living life. Kelly, I, I appreciate really that you're sharing that openly. And I almost wanted to hear kind of the, the nitty gritty and the ugliness of it, because unless you experience it yourself or see a loved one experiencing it, you know, and even how we can sometimes talk about it. I mean, it's, it's a really devastating um, situation to be in. And you mentioned the self-care piece, and that's been my experience seeing loved ones, is that the self-care just stops. It isn't even in the, the mental capacity to brush your teeth or, um, like, you, like you said, shower or whatever, because the, the cycle feels so deep in, right, of, of needing the substance, withdrawing from the substance, feeling like utter crap and searching for it again. You know, that's what I saw, at least from the outside. Uh, of my loved one that was going through a, an addiction to a substance. It's, it's phenomenal to, to see the power of that. And yet the power on the other hand for a recovery, for insight, for love, for understanding, for caring. And that's coming from the same place. So if listeners are confused by that, I'm, I'm talking about it's all coming from the principles of thought, consciousness, and mind. So it's coming from this energy field that we're, all, that we're all a part of. It's coming from our awareness in a moment. It's coming from the magical paintbrush of thought as it absolutely paints our reality moment by moment by moment. You know, one thing when I talk about thought, people will ask me about drug addiction. Well, how does that play in? Because there obviously are chemical changes or brain changes that occur if someone's been using a substance for a long period of time. That seems to be true. <laughs> that seems to be true to me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a neuroscientist. Um, and that's the principle of thought. The principle of thought is the uniqueness with which you have a hundred people that take the same drug, let's say cocaine. You're going to have a hundred different experiences of cocaine. You're going to have different side effects. It's also the same with prescription drugs. Why do some people experience side effects with the drug and others don't, or others experience this side effect that wasn't even listed on the label, right? It's that universal principle of thought as energy coming through into form and 
when it comes through our form is where we get those personalized results. And, and personalized is not the right word. It's where we get the individualized results because it's not something we have control over. Okay, so I want to I wanna make that really clear. <laughs> we can't control the universe energy and, and how we want it to interact with our brain chemistry if we do a certain drug or if we withdraw from a certain drug, right? It's going to show up as it shows up. But the beauty of the system is that it's always changing. You know, when you get through that initial 12 hours without a substance, the initial 24 hours without a substance, the initial 48 hours without that substance, your body will most likely begin to repair itself. And your brain, no matter how bad the damage is, always has the ability to rewire itself. The brain is really incredibly plastic. So that brings real practical hope for me, Kelly. Neuroscientist Sam Harris writes in his book, Waking Up, thinking is indispensable to us. It is essential for belief formation, planning, explicit learning, moral reasoning, and many other capacities that make us human. Thinking is the basis of every social relationship and cultural institution we have. It is also the foundation of science. But our habitual identification with thought, that is our failure to recognize thoughts as thoughts, as mere appearances in consciousness, is a primary source of human suffering. I have found myself, you know, falling in love in that big dream of, you know, marriage and things was always a part of life that I wanted as well with my music, was to be loved and, and feel love as though someone else can give me love. And... Well, what I do is then I would attach to that, to to other people, to those dates, you know, being honest to my situation. I've had two marriages and uh, both have ended in divorce, but they were good relationships always to, to start and as it usually goes. And but I would attach so hard to that. I would attach to that relationship as much as my music. And when things would start, if I, if I saw any possible action or words on their part that seemed outside this <laughs> cleverly set bunch of parameters of my expectations, of them, and and when when that need or that addiction to them would start to fail, then I would fall apart and look elsewhere for relief from again my thinking. Of course, I wasn't aware of that at the time. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's really like the the sheep and wolf's clothing with this. You know, listeners, stick in with us. If you think that thinking has nothing to do with addiction, then I really invite you to to continue to listen deeply because as Kelly is alluding, that's actually the most universal common thread that I've seen. The one thing that's really true about addiction is that it takes up a lot of mental bandwidth, right? So it takes up so much attention in our minds, in the form of the principle of thought. So Kelly is also talking about not just things he was conscious of, because I bet if I asked you then, Kelly, you wouldn't be conscious <laughs> about everything that you've said, right? You just had the experience of, I'm not doing music anymore. That's how I ident- used to identify myself. Now I'm in this relationship. Someone said something and now I feel hurt or I feel bad or whatever. And so I'm going to pick up this bottle or do, you know, what, whatever it is that you used to cope with it. So a lot of our thinking flies under the radar. I mean, it's unrecognized. It's that kind of thinking that usually drives us crazy, but thinking in the principle of thought, 
when we're talking about, as we talk about on the show, we're also talking about sensation and feeling. So I just want to simplify that for listeners and that, of course, that this absolutely relates to people that are suffering from the compulsive thoughts and use around substance. Or, or again, it doesn't always have to be substance like what Kelly said. It could be relationships. It could be other people. It could be sex. It could be gambling. It could be shopping. There are a myriad amount of ways that I've seen that human beings will try to numb themselves. I mean, also, Kelly, you know, people numb themselves also with breathing techniques or meditation or thinking techniques. So we're really on the show going to offer an alternative to that continual running away of of pain and running towards pleasure because there actually is another way of experiencing being human. Would you say that that's true, Kelly? Most definitely. And one of the things that really caught me first in what you were saying was those feelings that I experienced, anger. Oh my goodness, would I get angry if I saw any sign that things weren't going right with that addiction to the relationship in this case. And I would be angry. I would be upset. I would be anxious, always trying to fix, always trying to figure out how I can change the person, the loved one. And one of the classic things I found myself in was, or in both ways, was that in our conversations, if we'll call them conversations instead of rageful arguments, <laughs> a lot of the times it would start with, you make me feel. You make me feel this. And if it wasn't the other person and we were all happy in our accepted state of parameters, then it was my job. It was always something outside. And both of those things I can speak on um, as far as the relationship and the job too. These things outside ourselves that cause these feelings. And when we're so revved up in it, we can't find a solution when we can't fix all those things outside of ourselves is when we turn to whatever addiction there might be to, I kind of was researching in in this stumbling upon it. I kind of thought of it as self-prescribing an addiction. So basically without my realizing it, of course, at the time you don't realize what you're doing. You're just, you're providing relief to that, to that falling apart of expectations and things. Along the way, you lose sight of the fact that it's your relief. And you don't understand why you can't get away from it. And even though, like in my case, I wanted to. Pointing in that direction of thinking again, um, That's what is creating my experience of life. So instead of looking for that bottle or whatever the addiction might be, like you said, sex or gambling and things like this, whatever it is that provides relief at the end of the day from all that anger and those horrible feelings, it's it's only temporary. It's not lasting. So we find ourselves in this repetitive cycle. And like a prescription, we give it to ourselves every day or however often we need to escape. And that's where the trap is, is that we can't see that it's thought. We can't see that you make me feel is just not true. It's not possible for my loved one to make me feel something. Um... And, and, and vice versa, that I, I can't, <laughs> I have to accept the fact that I can't make them feel anything or, or change their behavior toward me. And um, 
of course, then that leads us to awareness. And at this point, maybe I'll let you see what you found insightful out of what I said, because this is a conversation, like Amy was saying, we're having this conversation so we can open up a space for others to be invited to see that there's more to an addiction than just the moral sense of being an outcast, being labeled an addict. There's, there's more to it. And, and there is hope at the end. Mm-hmm. That's really beautifully said, Kelly. I mean, there are so many places to go with this conversation, but before we get to the overall kind of societal misunderstandings, although it's kind of hard to kind of pick these apart because they're both so interlinked between societal expectation and rules with people's experience, especially if they don't see that rules are also constructs made by a society. And what is the building blocks of construct? It's thought. It's thought. Thought, belief, it's still the principle of thought. And when you start to see that every human being on this planet has what I would call the universally biased factor. So (laughs) every single human being is biased of how they experience the world. Everyone has their own history of thinking. They have their own meaning that they've made of experiences that they've had in their life. And this rings so true to me. So I have had a close family member suffer with really severe addiction, which of course is one reason I was so passionate about this particular podcast. And what I witnessed with that is a whole fury of emotions that occurred in the family dynamic. So also when I work with clients, this is no different. So when I talk to a father who has a daughter that's addicted to heroin, the father will feel like it's his fault. The father will feel guilty. The father will feel angry at moments. The father will feel sad and depressed. Another real common sensation is fear. I mean, I remember living that way. There were times when I thought, this is going to be the last time I see my loved one alive. And I really lived as if that was true. And at the end of the day, it it was thought. It was me using imagination, the principle of thought to predict what I thought the future would be. And in my situation, my loved one is recovered. I mean, my loved one isn't using any, any substances right now. And they have a, for all intents and purposes, you know, a happy, healthy life. But how that occurred wasn't through that person's willpower, number one. Okay. So the whole campaign in the eighties of just saying no, really misses the boat of, Mm. of the factors of addiction And I think that's also what creates kind of this societal stigma. It's like, well, you know, people, people, when people are unaware of their own bias through thought, they go around projecting their way of being in the world onto other people. And when other people don't act the way they would act, they get dumbfounded. They don't understand how could someone, what do you mean? You just don't use it. Don't stick that in your arm. Don't take that bottle. Don't call that woman again. Um, but, but the truth is every human being is living in a separate reality, first of all, and the, and the principle of thought and consciousness is extremely powerful in that it brings your unconscious and conscious thinking to life. So it feels real, right? Kelly, you, it's like, you wouldn't act on, you wouldn't have acted on these things if they didn't seem absolutely real and urgent for you in those moments. And what I hear with what you now see about that is this, I don't know if this is the right word, but a detachment from thought as who you are. And you start to see thought and consciousness for what it is, a constantly ebbing and flowing, constantly changing principle through which every human being has experience.
Let's take another break to neuroscientist Sam Harris's work, Waking Up. He says, Most of us let our negative emotions persist longer than is necessary. Becoming suddenly angry, we tend to stay angry. And this requires that we actively produce the feeling of anger. We do this by thinking about our reasons for being angry, recalling an insult, rehearsing what we should have said, and so forth. And yet we tend not to notice the mechanics of this process. Without continually resurrecting the feeling of anger, it's impossible to stay angry for more than a few moments. You can learn not to stay angry for very long. And when talking about the consequences of anger, for instance, the difference between moments in hours or days, is impossible to exaggerate. I remember when I started noticing these abrupt changes in mood myself, when I would realize that if I was sad or in an argument and then suddenly grandma called, I could immediately switch my tone of voice and my state of mind was magically changed. We all have experience of this. You could be sitting in traffic frustrated feeling stressed out because you're running late and then your best friend calls and then you spend the hour talking, laughing, and reminiscing. Let's listen to a point that Kelly makes about the power of the fact that we're always thinking without knowing that we're thinking. Then we're going to dive into some of the common trends that I've seen people up against when it comes to addiction. Our experience of life is 100% created on thought. And it's so, it seems, what are you telling me? Uh, y- yes, um, our experience of life is, is based on thought. And the fact that we're aware of our thinking, we're able to make that our reality. And it's so innocently hidden from us. Because of the conditioned thinking, because of the labels, because of what we're taught all along the way, you know, we 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 need to tie our shoes. <laughs> you know, it, it starts um, the conditioned thinking that we have, and and if it's possible for us to do so many amazing things like. Imagine what it was like when, what was it like when the earth was flat? What was thinking like that? The the earth is flat. I'm going to fall off the edge. Well, the earth is round. (laughs) Okay. Wow. That, that can't be. Well, it is. Um, All these things, we've stopped exploring our imagination and our possibilities and, and, spent so much time living in the experience of our thought without knowing it and using the outside influences like kids, loved ones, jobs, etc. One of the questions I've been dying to ask you is, is, and I think you've maybe pointed it out already, that creating that space or, or being willing to listen is a beginning at least. Do you think that that's a good start for, for one that, like me, who's been addicted and maybe recovered or not, I guess, that having this understanding might give our loved ones a chance to feel forgiven themselves or, or be relieved of that fear that, uh, or, or the memories and things that we cling on to from the past instead of moving forward. Do you, do you think that's a good start? Yeah, I think hand in hand with the listening piece, what I've seen in my work and in my personal life is the listening piece is crucial, but sometimes it's like people aren't even aware or don't even know how to listen without an agenda. Because even the the loved ones themselves are so caught up in their own thought storms 
right? Because if we dial this back, I mean, logistically, things really do happen when people are in the throes of addiction, right? There are sometimes pieces of jewelry that go missing, for instance, or violence occurs or any other effect occurs as a result of someone seeking a substance to feel better. I remember speaking with one client and she said, you know, it just doesn't even feel like my son anymore. And I have to also commend that client because similarly to the listening piece, she wasn't just listening to her loved one. She was listening to herself and that began to guide her through an intensely, as she described it, chaotic, difficult, continually, you know, continuing crisis uh, situation that went on for years. And I'll just give a real, a real example of this with the client. So of course, you know, in this case, it was a parent and the child was under 18 years of age. So the parent does have legal rights to again, enroll the, the, the child in different programs and different rehab programs and things like that. So that's what, that's what the client did. She did what occurred to her to do, but then what I thought was so beautiful in her sharing her story with me is that there was advice that she was getting from some of these centers. Um, because again, her, her child had been in and out of several rehabs. It wasn't just a one time thing, but one of them in particular was really advising her that if the child comes back to the home, not to let the child in the house to basically, if the child is going to quit this rehab program, then the child's going to have to know that they're going to be out on the street, that the family isn't going to support them anymore. And she was very, very conflicted about this, my client, because in her gut, that didn't seem right. She felt that she would just be throwing her child at the mercy now of people that were going to use the child to run drugs or, or worse or, or other things that could happen. And I thought it was so beautiful that the client really leaned into her wisdom and, and said, you know what, I'm not going to listen to the advice of this rehab center and, and let her child back in. And the child did end up over years recovering from that addiction. And also that family dynamic is reported to be pretty healthy and happy in spite of very dramatic, very traumatic years of conflict, of anger, of arguments, of distrust, of manipulation. So all those things can happen. And like what Kelly's alluding to, once they've happened, they've already happened. You're only keeping that alive by bringing a sense of attention and focus and seriousness, dare I say, to those memories, right? I'm not saying that it wasn't a serious situation that happened, but the truth is it's right now, it's just thought, it's air. It's it's not really happening right now. So you don't have to go into that whole story again. You don't have to take that seriously. When individuals begin to identify to to disassociate rather from the voice in their head. That's always thinking that, that honestly has different opinions all the time. That's going through all these ebbs and flows of emotion. When people start to realize that they're not the voice in their head, they're the listener of the voice in their head. It's a game changer. And in that way, when people begin to get that awareness, often it's much easier for them to show up and listen without their own agenda, because they let the thoughts pass through like birds in the sky because they know their personal thinking doesn't matter right now. Did that answer any of your questions, Kelly? Oh, beautifully. <laughs> what a, yeah. Oh, Amy. Um, yes, that was a beautiful uh, story for one thing. And of course, wow, this topic, I, there's so many things we could go, but um Detachment, as you mentioned, um, not allowing someone back in the house and her following her wisdom like that, that, and then now seeing that reportedly that things are good to a certain balance. I mean, that's such a beautiful story. And even just in the research, yet I don't have to search far to find uh, where 
information out there is saying detach, detach. You, you know, you, you have to force them to make their decisions in the case of a child too. Uh, you know, uh, I've heard stories where, you know, teenagers coming out of high school maybe have addictions already, you know, at, even in high school, of course. But they, they're so attached to the security of home sometimes that um, maybe kicking them out is the answer, but really just dropping into that, that open space um, and detachment should be, I think there should be a discussion showing up more when I go research. <laughs> there should be more about the detachment that we need to make mentally from our memories, from our thoughts, the things that we constantly rev up. I, I can't imagine. And this is where I can't speak as a loved one I heard that, that just forgiveness looks bleak at best. I can tell that that's, probably rooted so deep in that every time a thought of me or might come up, it's, it's that repetitive thing. There's a, there's a construct, there's a block because the, uh, it, it's been decided based on what I did or the, their emotions for it have been decided that I've done something that's just unforgivable. Uh, I keep going back to that, but detachment mentally from the thinking, from the process and opening up to more and, and just realizing that thought creates our experience of life and just being aware that they are just thoughts, even just that in itself can allow someone to have that listening that goes beyond listening without an agenda. Us human beings, I mean, we don't have a realistic gauge of, of control, right? You, you know, it's like the, you know, the character Monica on Friends, Kelly, have you ever, heard, have you ever seen that show? Oh, yes. <laughs> She's like super control freak, like oh. type A trying to do everything. So there's people on that spectrum. And then there's people I meet that don't take any real action. They think, well, you know, if the universe wants me to die, then I'm going to die, you know, but they keep smoking cigarettes, even though they have lung cancer right? So there's this in-between area that to me is more aligned with what's true. It's like what you're saying about the earth being round and not flat. What seems true to me is there are actions that we can take as human beings and we can't control the people around us. We just can't. That's not possible. It's not possible. We cannot get into their physiology. We can't like become a little, <laughs> I don't know where this analogy is going. We can't become like a little speckle of energy, get into their brain and body and make them feel something, right? We can't do that, but we think we can. And the last part of this, so we have people that were as, as a species, right? I don't want to say like people like I'm pointing a finger. I'm included in this folks. Okay. <laughs> so we're, we're walking around really busy and most of us don't even recognize that the busyness comes from thought. Then we have this piece of thinking that we can control more than we really can or thinking we have no control or we do have control. And the third piece is we really think that we're fortune tellers. We really think we can predict the future, but the truth is the, the future is an in complete equation. We don't have all the information in the future. Yes, you've had an experience of life and how it works in your physiology. You have experiences, you have them enough. They get wired up to other things in your brain, right? So then they get stored in your memory. And then you use that to predict the future. But that's incredibly flawed. It, it leaves out a huge, huge factor which we've talked about throughout most of the show, that is you can never predict what you're going to be thinking in the future. So you can't predict how resiliently you'll be, how you could show up with creative ideas. You don't know. That's the truth. We don't even know what we're going to think or say five seconds from now, Kelly, let alone five years from now or 10 years from now and worried that a loved one's going to relapse again. All that worryful thinking isn't taking us anywhere. It's just creating discomfort. 
and, and it really pulls us out of reality. It's this beautiful piece of navigating fact from fiction that can begin to be really incredibly practical for human beings as they bump up against real world stuff, real world circumstances like addiction of loved ones or themselves. You've reached the end of part one. For part two, where we talk about some case studies I've seen with clients and how they've dealt specifically with loved ones that had an addiction. And also for our list of resources, please listen to part two, which is listed right below in your podcast feed.